stars of arthroplasty in India and Egypt. Uh, Professor Teddy Mohan, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, Department of Orthopedics, School of Medicine, Koshi, and uh, Professor Wael Samir, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Shams University. Uh, many thanks to uh, my dear friend, Dr. Sir Nivaskan Hamti, for being the moderator for the Indian part of this uh, very fruitful uh, course and very scientific and fruitful cooperation between uh, Egypt and India. Many thanks to the Egyptian Orthopedic Association and the Indian Orthopedic Association for sponsoring this course. Many thanks to Ortho TV for live streaming this webinar to all the Asian countries and the countries all over the world, and also to Eva Pharma Company for sponsoring this course. Many thanks to all of you. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Professor Teddy Mohan. Professor Teddy will speak about robotics in total and partial knee arthroplasty, and uh, Dr. Zernivas will be the moderator of this uh, part of this session. Please, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. As always, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Elisha, Egypt, Egyptian Orthopedic Association, Indian Orthopedic Association, Auto TV for this uh, opportunity and the excellent course. Uh, the, the speaker today is uh, Dr. Tadi Mohan. Uh, he is uh, a well-known uh, robotic knee surgeon from India. He's a consultant and a clinical professor robotic joint replacement and sports medicine department of orthopedics at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research in Cochin, in a state called Kerala in India. Uh, he has done his fellowship in arthroplasty and sports medicine in Lyon, uh, France. And uh, he has also worked uh, as a faculty in NHS UK between 97 and 2007. Uh, he's been using the first MAKO robot uh, in India. Uh, since 2017, and he's a member of HIP uh, Subspecialty Committee of SICOT and reviewer of uh, Indian Journal of Orthopedics. He's a faculty speaker in multiple national and international orthopedic meetings and orthoplasty meetings. He's a life member of uh, several associations and societies and has more than 24 years, 25 years of uh, orthopedic experience. Uh, and specialized in robotic joint arthroplasty and uh, sports medicine. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tadi, for accepting our invite to uh, give us the talk today. Ah, uh, Please. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all, uh, Srinivas, uh, Professor Mahmud, Professor Will Samir, uh, and the audience. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited to this August forum. I was just telling uh, 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 the other members that uh, I have very fond memories of uh, uh, visiting Egypt uh, several years ago with my family. And, uh, you know, we still talk about uh, riding the camels and, you know, the magnificence of the pyramids. Uh, so uh, great to be uh, with you all. I will just... Uh, share my screen sorry yes i hope you can all see that so uh, today my topic is uh, robotics and knee arthroplasty uh, so I thought uh, I will uh, say a few things about uh, total and partial. It's a vast topic and I have uh, picked a few things. I, there will be a bit of an overlap. Please forgive me. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. So uh, my disclosure is that uh, uh, the, the, the robot that I use is, is from the Striker company and uh, they were responsible for my training. Uh, this is the institute. Sorry. Sorry. This is the institute I uh, currently work in. Uh, it is in the southern part of India. Uh, so to give you a better idea of where I am in India, you can see the, the map of India. Uh, and... Uh, Kerala or Kochi is, is really 
at the tail end you know you can see at the tip and the triangular tip the portion that is in green and the uh, cochin is is right here uh so uh these are some of the certificates uh we were given after we had attended several sessions of uh, uh workshops uh visited several surgeons watched them operating uh you know uh, we we worked on cadavers as well um so what i want to say uh, i mean the idea of showing you those certificates is that i think uh, contrary to what i thought you know i had lot of years of experience in uh, non robotic manual uh, surgery and i thought uh, you know i was completely qualified but not really uh, robotics uh, you need a lot of training as well and i think uh, that is that is very important that we do it the right way it's a new technology uh, which i realized uh so just to go back to a little bit of history uh it was very interesting once i got into robotics i was you know reading up here and there and i found out that the earliest robot is 450 years old uh it's called the clockwork prayer apparently this this particular priest comes out at 6:00 uh, o'clock uh, every evening uh, uh and uh, moves his arms uh, uh everything uh, says a i mean i don't know if he says a prayer but he most certainly uh, thanks to this gentleman who created him this italian uh, giovanni uh, toriani almost 450 years ago which is amazing to to realize and we all know isaac asimo a very famous writer many of us have read his books and he coined the robotics terminology almost 80 years ago in 1942 Uh, little did he realize that robotics will become such a buzzword uh, in hollywood movies uh, in artificial intelligence and even uh, bollywood uh, rajini kant he is a, is a very famous south indian actor who acted as a robot so uh, a bit of history uh, 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 sorry to bore you with all these facts but if you look uh, 1990 was when uh, howard paul and william barger created uh, a first kind of robot in orthopedics uh, so uh, we had the robodoc system uh, which really came out um, uh, for hip replacement it was it was giving uh, it was doing very good uh, milling of the femur uh, precision of uh 96% compared to 75% with manual broaching and only in 2006 the meko um uh, uh company was formed as taken over by striker uh, and they created the acrobot system um and now we have the fourth generation of meko robot uh, to give you a, a perspective there are about 600 or more in the us and about a dozen in, in india so robotics uh, there are basically active passive semi active uh, the active system is where the uh, uh, surgeon supervises the robot online uh, the surgeon cannot modify the actions he can only he or she can only interrupt and the robot is capable of performing individual tasks autonomously like the robodoc or the casper robots then there is a passive system where the surgeon maintains the control of resection the robot cannot perform tasks individually uh, and you have the semi active which is the meko robot which i will generally uh, talk about today where the, uh, the surgeon controls the milling but the robot gives a force feedback called the haptic feedback which will constrain the surgeon to to stay safe Uh, so the final control is is with the surgeon but there is a computer uh, aided burr uh, which which the robot is capable of that is the meko system and then another thing about robotics is it can either be uh, an image based so where you are taking a ct or a mri pre op uh, or it can be an imageless system 
So these are the main things about robots. The other uh, thing also is whether it's an open or closed system, which means that only one specific manufacturer's implant can be used if it's a closed system. And if it's an open system, several different companies of implants may be used. So uh, Amrita Hospital, where I work, has got an advanced center. It is an advanced center for robotic surgery. So we have the ROSA, uh, which is really uh, used by neurosurgeons. The cyber knife is used by the oncologists. And then we have the Da Vinci, which is uh, used by urologists, gastros, and, and gynae surgery. And the Mako robotic system uh, is a new uh, acquisition by our hospital. Uh, the thing about the Mako robotic system, I can uh, tell you is that on one platform, single platform, you have both uh, hip replacement uh, and uh, total and partial knee replacement possible. It basically consists of this uh, body with a robotic arm to which you can attach uh, a burr or a reamer uh, or a saw depending on the kind of surgery you're doing. It also has a camera stand and a guidance card uh, on which uh, you know information is, is uh, fed into. So we got this uh, for the first time in India in 2017. Uh, and in case you're wondering what a shark has to do with a, with a, uh, with our topic today, uh, the Mako, the name comes from the shark, which is uh, very prevalent in, in and around Florida, where this, this company is located. So in 2017, we got uh, partial knee and hip replacement. In 2018, we got total knee. So if you, if you ask me how we go about a typical uh, knee replacement, we do the following x-rays. So we, we do long, I mean, long standing views. Uh, I also do a Rosenberg view, which is really a 45 degree flexion view, more uh, relevant in unicompartmental uh, uh, arthritis, if it is a, a lateral uni or lateral unicompartmental or medial unicompartmental arthritis. There's something called a Rosenberg view, 45 degree flexion view, uh, which, which I also do, apart from the usual skyline and lateral views. And uh, ever since uh, we had acquired the robot, I have been looking out for unicompartmental disease, uh, which earlier I was not very particular about, but now I look out for patellofemoral arthritis. I look out for, you know, uh, uh, specifically uh, medial or lateral unicompartmental disease. There is also a CT scan involved uh, for all robotic cases. We have to do a preoperative CT scan. And it is uh, basically uh, the leg, uh, whole leg is scanned uh, and it's loaded into the MAKO system to create a, a personalized virtual image. So you are creating a, a 3D scan for every patient virtually, for every knee that you're operating, for every hip that you're operating. And this helps uh, to determine preoperatively the component size, the position, the optimal alignment based on the, the landmarks, uh, the depth of bony resection, the deformity correction, the boundaries of bone removal. So it gives us a whole lot of information and the uh, surgeon can also fine tune the implant position during the surgery uh, based on ligament balancing and things like that. So uh, to, to give you an idea of how a uh, 3D personalized image looks like, this is how a typical image would look for any knee that I'm operating robotically. It will show me uh, the following uh, you know, uh, views of the femur in extension and inflection and the tibia also. So you can see uh, all these numbers are basically, they are telling me, how much bone has to be resected, et cetera, how much deformity there is, et cetera. So a resection view of the bone that I'm going to operate, the knee I'm going to operate, it will show me exactly how much bone will be lost, you know, after resection. I will not go into all the individual numbers and uh, 
will get a bit boring. But I can tell you that in the coronal view, uh, I can, uh, it will tell me what is the varus and the valgus angle compared to the mechanical axis. It will tell me, uh, you know, the, the resection depth. So, for example, here you can see seven and four uh, medially, laterally. So, it is telling me in millimeters that I will be taking out seven millimeters on the medial side and four millimeters on the lateral side. So, and, uh, you know, I, I, it also tells me uh, the, the component, the largest component that will fit on the femur without notching it, without overhanging the borders and without stuffing the patellofemoral component. So, for example, here you can see an, a, 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 an implant which looks very small, right? So, uh, whereas if I put femur 4, you can see how well it is fitting. So, this is how I can actually... Uh, you know, precisely decide on the component size uh, uh, by means of the CT scan preoperative plan. So again, on the sagittal view, for example, here you, you can see that the component, if it is flexed too much, it is not sitting properly. Whereas if it is in, uh, you know, two degree of flexion, it fits it perfectly. So I can actually preoperatively, even before touching the patient, I can actually decide that I'm going to put the component in two degree flexion and that is going to fit uh, my uh, femur best. So the posterior slope of the tibial component can be decided upon and just by toggling some switches, you know, the, by moving the arrow this way and that way, we can, we can get the anterior and posterior sizing of the implants perfectly, which I think is a, is a big uh, uh, advantage. Uh, earlier, I was not uh, very particular about this in the sense I used to do it on table. You know, on table, you feel, oh, okay, this looks better. Uh, that doesn't uh, look uh, better. I mean, doesn't look too good. So let me settle for this. It used to be uh, an eyeballing or uh, the feel uh, earlier with manual, but from with robotics, I know exactly how it will look and how it will fit, which is, uh, you know, uh, I feel is very precise technology, which I have started appreciating only now. So on the transverse view, uh, you can move the femur and adjust the posterior resection, which is again, uh, very, very precise. And here again, by moving uh, the, the component of the tibia, I can adjust the rotation. So uh, why I'm showing you all these bits is you, you can realize just by playing around with the images, the surgeon uh, himself or herself can, can make so many adjustments. And you know, you can, even before you operated the patient, you can decide exactly how your um, implants will look, what size you want, etc., and the position. So the other thing about robotics is there is something called arrays uh, and checkpoints and probes. And these are the things you have to be familiar with in robotics. So arrays are those, those uh, two pins that you are seeing both on the femur and on the tibial side. We are putting these pins um, uh, even before we start the surgery. Uh, once we open the knee, uh, you can see that we are attaching these uh, discs. These are called the arrays uh, and uh, these are important you will realize when we are communicating with the robot uh, so the the important uh, thing about uh, robotic is bony points have to be registered very accurately so this is where all these uh, you know all these pins and arrays and the probe which i'm holding as you can see helps us uh, to uh, register the bony landmarks because ultimately with robots it's the information you feed in is the information you uh, you get out so if you feed accurate information you will get you the the values very accurately if you don't feed them properly you may get it wrong so you one can argue that you know you have to be very precise uh, in your uh, uh, bony registration
So the first thing that we do after we have put these arrays and uh, um, uh, you know there are some checkpoints like we put small um, metallic pins on the femur and on the on the tibia. Uh, so we do what is called the bony registration, which involves finding the hip center, and then we need to uh, touch the medial and lateral malleoli with the probe. And we are also touching the checkpoints, as you can see with the probe. And then there are certain uh, points we have to burst on the bone. For example, here, uh, the tibia, you can see, um, you know, there are various points. So with the probe, we are touching those points and we are communicating uh, between the patient's anatomy and the, the Mako robotic system. So this allows for real-time tracking of the planned implant position before and during preparation. So the, 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 the system already has a CT scan picture in mind. And now by touching the real body or uh, the patient, we are corresponding, we are letting the robot know that this part is proximal tibia, this part is the distal femur. So the robot understands that, uh, you know, this is what, it, it corresponds to real time. So if I move the leg, the robot understands that I'm moving the tibia. The tibia has moved by 10 degrees or the femur has rotated by 20 degrees or whatever. So uh, that is the importance of registration. And here I just wanted to show you, uh, there is a very fancy foot rest which comes uh, with the robotic system. And uh, earlier, earlier I used to use this uh, but uh, now I find it a bit cumbersome and I, I do many of my cases without this leg holder. This is a leg holder which, which is being designed for, uh, you know, if you don't have any assistance, if you're doing it alone, it's very convenient. But it's not uh, an absolute must. Now, the other thing about robotic is that you have to understand the colors on the screen. For example, the, the native bone or the bone which has been resected is, is seen in white. What you have to resect is seen in green. And if you have over resected, it looks red. So these are the basic colors uh, one has to uh, understand. So uh, one thing about uh, robotic resection is the bone, when you resect it, it's, it certainly looks very, very smooth compared to compared to manual. And probably because in when you are doing it in the hand, there is probably a bit of shake. But when we do it with the robotic arm, it is it's much more smoother. Um, so this is how robotic uh, bone preparation is done. Once the, reg once the registration is over, uh, you can see the robotic arm, uh, the saw is attached to the robotic arm. And, and we, we cut according to the, the plan. Now, there is something called a haptic feedback. The haptic feedback is basically, I told you, a semi-active robot is under the surgeon's control. The robotic arm is under the surgeon's control. But at the same time, we are getting a real-time tactile feedback, uh, you know, uh, from the robot. So, uh, let me see, show you one video for that. So this, these pictures show the robot uh, before it's draped and after it's draped. It's got a sterile drape which just goes over it like a glove and you can see how it looks in the theater. Uh, this is just, uh, again, uh, one of the laws of robotics taken from Isaac Asimov's novels where he says a robot may not injure a human being. Uh, so maybe based on that, the haptic feedback also works. Uh, haptic feedback is like a boundary. And on the screen, when you're using the saw, you can see two lines, which tell you that you must stay within these two lines you know, to cut the bone safely. So that is what, if you, if you cross these lines, the robot saw will stop uh, or it will make a, a jarring sound. And you can sometimes extend the boundary if you feel it is a bit too narrow. But this haptic is, is very uh, safe and it makes the whole operation uh, extremely um, safe. So we have, we have close to 
you know, a thousand uh, uh, cases so far, and we still uh, touch wood have not uh, done any significant soft tissue injury. Uh, or I can I can't think of any ligament or any patellar tendon or anything being cut. Uh, you know, in all these cases, thanks to the, the robotic feedback. So one feels very safe with the haptic window. It's called like, it's like a window where you're working and you can see the image of the saw. So uh, this is a small uh, uh, video which uh, was recorded when I was learning. And you can see an American surgeon is, is helping us That sound is there when the robot is being operated. So, And on the left, you can see as the saw is cutting the green area which needs to be cut, the bone is turning white. So as it turns white, we realize that the cutting is complete. So it will allow us to cut only uh, as much as we planned. The depth of resection will be as many millimeters we have planned before the surgery began. So we'll just progress. And this is a couple of uh, things. One is the RASTI score, which has been devised by Professor Haddad in uh, the United Kingdom. And they came out with, with a particular scoring of macroscopic soft tissue injury. Uh, and uh, they divided the knee into several compartments, like lateral, medial, posterior, patellar tendon, etc. And uh, they came up with the score and they found out that it's it's extremely low for for robotics and uh, the the instrument on the right is is the uh, gel fee retractor which i frequently use uh, that is the only retractor i use uh, to keep the knee open when i'm doing the surgery so uh, just a few more slides of how it looks for example here you have the deformity so when you when you open the knee when you have uh, started uh, when you have finished your reg registration the computer will immediately show you that this is the intraoperative native deformity or the starting position so you know you have uh, you know 24 degree varus uh, whereas you plan 22 degree varus and you know how much flexion there is how much extension there is and also it will tell you what is the difference once the PCL is released. So we know the PCL, the, the posterior crucial ligament is a medial stabilizer. And I have noticed uh, that many times once you release the PCL, the gaps open up, which is, which is very fascinating. You know, you can see the values changing as you release the PCL. So as the uh, ligament balancing begins, first you do it in extension and then you look at the numbers. See, for example, uh, sorry, for example, here you have a three degree varus and you have a, a medial gap of you know, 19 degrees versus 21 degrees. So it's more lax on the lateral side. So you know that immediately. And uh, you also know how many millimeters there is the difference. And accordingly, we can adjust our rectangular gaps by moving the components, uh, you know, or by tilting your varus cut, by, by changing the version of the uh, femoral component. So subtle changes of ligament balancing can, can occur by, by making several adjustments uh, in, in various places, both in extension 
and inflection. So for example, uh, if you want to open a medial gap in a varus knee, you can do a few things like you can recut uh, the tibia in uh, by two degrees and that will open your medial gap by two millimeters. You can you can reposition the varus tibial component. Uh, you can reposition it in varus by two degrees or to four degrees. You can adjust the femoral position. Uh, you can give it a one or two degree valgus uh, position of the femoral component and that will open up the medial gap. You can externally rotate the femur by one or two degrees and that will open up the medial gap by two millimeters. So what I'm trying to show you is that by subtle changes, uh, or by uh, uh, changing the angle or the position of the femoral component or the tibial component, uh, it will affect the planned resection depths of the respective bones. So by just doing these changes, we can, we can open up the medial space and then we can take our uh, cuts after doing all these changes. So this is what I meant by dynamic joint balancing where we are moving the components uh, in, in by subtle degrees, by, uh, by few millimeters this way and that way and we are getting the gaps balanced, both in extension and flexion. So it is really a dynamic kind of joint balancing. So finally, what I'm uh, showing you here is, is a, 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 a knee which was earlier looking like this. And after all the changes that we have done uh, by intraop, uh, change in planning, uh, the, the depths of the cut, etc., by changing the component position, we have finally got it very well balanced. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, our final balancing, final plan will be something like this. So this knowledge that you can make such changes by altering a few values here and there, it is it equips you much better so that any deformity that you have uh, can be, you know, very well balanced. And here we have a few examples of, uh, you know, the earlier knees. My earlier knees used to be uh, ones where I was playing it very safe. So with minimal deformities, I used to go around till I understood, uh, you know, the, the, the system better. Then slowly I started going in, trying in more complex virus, then bilateral knees, then extra articular deformities. Uh, and, you know, we can get very good uh, planning uh, through robotics in extra articular deformities. And slowly we venture into more complex deformities and we got them straight. And here I have a case uh, which uh, we did recently of a robotic uh, replacement in a severe deformity. And here you can see the lady when she stands, she has got, you know, um, phenomenal virus, very severe in the, in the uh, you know, I will just take you through it. So she's a 68 uh, year old female, morbid fear of hospitals. She came to me in a wheelchair and uh, she has great difficulty standing and walking. And finally, she agreed that robotic surgery, I mean, she agreed to robotic surgery because, uh, you know, she had heard that it is less painful compared to normal surgery. So here she is, and you can see her walking uh, with great difficulty. And, uh, you know, you wonder how, how she has managed. And apparently, she has not stepped out of the house for uh, the past 10 years uh, because of the difficulty that she is facing just walking. And so we did uh, the usual radiological workup. Um, you know, we, we held the limb, uh, gave it a passive stress, and we managed to find the deformities were like this. Her genuvarum uh, on each side was something like 45 degrees. She had bilateral fixed flexion deformities of 20 degrees. So very, very gross deformities, as you can see. And uh, this is how she was intra-op already prepped. Uh, ready to go. I always mark my incisions. Uh, I, I, I feel that, you know, it gives you clarity 
and here you can see uh, the right side deformity is very very severe 38 45 degrees depending on how uh, which angle you look at the left side is also equally bad but not too bad uh, 32 39 degrees so basically uh, what i wanted to share with you is with the robotic help we kind of uh, assessed all the deformities we realized how much bone needs to be cut and we didn't straight away go and cut the bone uh, immediately because there was a lot of ligamentous laxity so we started off with what is called an enhanced mid resection so we did a conservative cut we did instead of cutting say 5 millimeters we cut 1 millimeter or 2 millimeters to start with then reassess the deformity and then completed the the cuts and you can see how bad it was once we opened it inside there was no shape the bone everything looked misshapen there was lot of bone loss uh, and i had to uh, bone graft using the bone that we cut i used that only to to screw it back the tibia half of it was missing so we used uh, the 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 part of femur that we cut we we managed to screw it on and you can see in trop severe deformities and those are the arrays uh, attached to the femur and tibia uh, again another view of it uh, during the surgery and ultimately we managed to get it uh, in this position and you can see the the pre op and the post op correction uh, it looks almost perfect and uh, we are very happy that we could uh, you know do uh, such a good correction and we uh, felt that there was completely altered soft tissue as well and not just the bony anatomy uh, bone grafting was required and the collateral ligaments were stretched but the robotics uh, pre op scan helped us um, you know for a personalized plan and we could correct it to the pre planned level of correction uh hyperextension was avoided which is one of the problems of correcting such severe deformities and the implant sizes were perfect so these are some of the papers that we have written over the years um so i will just uh, uh, talk a few words on partials now you can see we have done uh, medial lateral partials bicompartmental where you do uh one side uh, uni compartment like a medial or a lateral uni plus a patellofemoral so we can do patellofemoral also uh, and why do partial knees when when total knees is doing quite well well um, you know uh, early uh, presentations all not all of them present uh, in tricompartmental disease the uh, partial knees have definitely better range of motion better kinematics lesser pain faster recovery and it can be done both in in young patients as well as elderly patients depending on how bad the disease is um, and what the patients tell me is that they feel more normal with a partial knee um, so ever since the robot came in i have been looking out for unicompartmental disease and what i have realized is more than 40% of the knee knees total knees that we do are actually unicompartmental pathology and all of you would also agree that many times when you open a knee we we wish that we had partial done a partial instead of a total so uh one important thing is for a partial knee you should be able to correct the varus and valgus deformity it should not be very severe it should be less than 12 degrees of varus or valgus passive correctability is is crucial pre op and like like a typical robotic this thing we do a ct scan it's an image based technology uh, so we do a ct scan and uh, the age can be anything from 40 to 80 years there should be a good pre op range of movement of at least 10 to 90 degrees no recurvatum no osteoporosis it will be nice if you have an acl intact but i have done uh, without acl also and the workflow is pretty much like you are getting an idea of wh what i have been telling you in the total knee so ct scan then you plan it uh, there is a femur tibia uh, pre op plans and then you capture the poses you do a cap balancing uh, and you do cartilage mapping these are things which we do intra op 
and then finally once we have registered the bone you do the preparation uh, so just a few slides again uh, of the ct scan here you can see how a ct scan in a in a unique compartmental knee looks like you have the femoral the tibial compart uh, tibial component you can see it in various angles sagittal transverse and you can you can adjust your rotation uh, everything and of course uh, the markers are the same uh, and we we do all the registration uh, uh, of nearly 40 points both on the tibia and on the femur uh, and during the surgery we we have to move the knee uh, in various degrees to get an idea of 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 the ligament balance um so i will uh, skip all that and the idea of this graph as you can see is we understand the looseness of the joint based on this graph how loose or how tight the joint is so uh, accordingly we can adjust the position of the cuts based on the looseness if it is very loose then we'll move the components a uh, bit down so that they tighten up so that the the looseness is not so bad if it is too tight we will we'll, we will uh, you know we will sink the components a bit more um so again a few more slides about how accurate we can be uh, we 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 try not to make the component very proud so here you have a, a femoral component and based on the cartilage mapping uh, we make sure that it is not too proud otherwise it will be uh, you know very uncomfortable and it will it will stuff the joint so there are various ways of making sure there are various views the various uh, calculations uh, intra op that you can do you can move the component this way and that way you can adjust the slope and get it very precise so again this is a uh, 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 this is a uh, uh, intra op video you can see uh, some of these have been taken from a, a product video uh, just wanted to show you by using a bar how how we can prepare the bone now i just want to tell you one thing that uh we no longer use the bar uh for the entire uh uh unicompartmental knee the new development in the robot is we use a saw for all the transverse cuts so for the tibial transverse cut we use a saw for the posterior femoral condyle cut we use a saw and for the rest of it we use the bar so these are a few changes which have happened over the years so this is how it looks you know as we are burring the femur or the tibia Uh, it will turn from green to white as you complete the burring. Uh, just I wanted to show this picture of how the bar looks uh, up close, six millimeter bar, and here you have uh, very well prepared on your left side. Uh, you can see uh, a, a femoral medial femoral condyle which has been prepared, uh, which has been burred, and what I wanted to show you is. uh the acl has not been touched i mean it is so precise this burring that the acl is is not you know disturbed at all and these are the components that we use for partial knees and this is how a partial knee looks like intra op uh just a few more pictures to show a patellofemoral replacement so how precise it is how uh, how colorful it looks Uh, it's almost like playing a video game uh, so the green shows you the plan the white shows you uh, how it will uh, i mean how it looked after removing the excess bone or the damaged bone and you here you have an intra op picture of of uh, the actual photograph and then you have a picture of the components in place so the the patella is got a resurfacing uh, like we usually do the the trochlea there is a trochlear plate which has got three pegs and that's how it uh, it fits on onto the trochlea and that is how patellofemoral replacement is done so uh, another video here you can see uh, a patient uh, who 
has starting trouble uh, you can see she is struggling uh, as she stands up and it takes a few minutes for her to uh, you know she wobbles around struggles for the first few minutes and then slowly she is able to walk slightly better uh, but but you can see that the starting trouble is very very uh, classical and then she will be limping around and she will manage and the same patient uh, after uh, you know the operation has been done she has had a medial uh, unicompartmental replacement done and you can see the sorry let me go back and you can see how she stands without any uh, help straight ahead and she's walking much better uh, this is the same lady uh, who struggled and is now much more comfortable uh, she is actually my mother in law and i took a permission to uh, share her video so i have since replaced both her knees with a unicompartmental and she's uh, in her mid 70s and very happy so a few more pictures to show uh, how versatile partial knee has uh, can be and these are all uh, my own cases which i would have never dreamt of doing before the robot came you know i used to do only total knees i had done uh, oxford knees in uk but you know uh, i stopped doing oxford when i had a few complications uh, and i was a bit uh, um disheartened with with the partials until the robot came along and then i realized it can be so precise and so safe that i have started it uh, doing it uh, with renewed uh, you know uh, vigor and gusto and now we have so many different varieties of partial knees in various situations uh, for example here there is a, a plate laterally uh, and uh, you know the patient developed severe it was obviously an osteotomy uh patient developed severe medial uh, compartment pain and by just taking off a few screws we could do a medial uni uh this is a correctable varus 15 degrees and the lateral uh, uh, on the left side it was a correctable varus of 23 degrees but i was i burnt my fingers i thought i can do unis in both but i realized uh, my mistake intraop and i could uh, change it just in time i i changed it to a total because i realized that if you if you uh, go beyond 12 degrees you run into trouble so uh, i learned that for unis to succeed the deformity should be less than 12 degrees so in my experience the benefits so far have been uh, you know the pre op plan is is a big boon you get immediate feedback flexibility there is a confidence in planning and executing your cases the surgery is so precise less bone and soft tissue damage because you're cutting less uh, you're cutting in millimeters uh, you never go beyond uh, 7 or 8 millimeters of bone um, or sometimes less a very accurate safe reproducible short learning curve of 10 cases on an average my numbers have increased and it's a very good teaching training and a research tool because we have a lot of post graduates and we can explain to them what we are trying to do and it handles like a video game and uh, i couldn't uh, stop from putting a picture of myself there uh, thank you very much thank you so much professor tadi mohan for this very interesting talk about a very interesting topic thank you so much sir it's it's an honor to be with us sir thank you thank you professor uh oh, i hope it wasn't <laughs> wasn't too boring <laughs> no 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 not at all sir not at all it's very interesting thank you so much professor sir nivas please sir thank thank you very much for the excellent presentation very good cases uh, uh, you have demonstrated um it's a it's a very good tool to have uh, looks like and uh, uh again once again thank you for uh, uh, accepting the invite and giving us the talk just a few questions uh, yeah um uh, about the learning curve um how long do you think it will take to learn to do properly uh, with the uh, with the robot 
And uh, when you are doing a semi-active uh, robo, what percentage of the procedure is done by you, and uh, what procedure, what percentage is done by the robo, and, and uh, the same percentages in an active, um, uh, fully active robo. I, I I cannot uh, uh, speak for a fully active robo because. No experience with that, but uh, in a semi-active uh, construct such as ours, uh, I think uh, you know the ninety-five uh, percent, or I would say ninety-nine percent, of the operation is actually done by the surgeon. Uh, the robotic arm, I mean, of course, the planning uh, helps. Uh, you know, the planning and all that is done with the software. But once the robot come and once once uh, the robot comes in and once you're holding the robotic arm, unless you press the trigger, the robot will not saw anything on its own. Uh, you can point the robotic arm with the saw uh, to the knee, but it will not cut by itself. You have to press the trigger. So the ultimate control lies with the surgeon. So unless you are using the the robotic arm with the saw. Uh, and taking it in front of the knee and actually pressing the trigger, uh, nothing will happen. And the only thing, like I said, is you have to stay within the 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 haptic, the boundary. The on the screen you can see two lines. You can see if you're cutting the femur or the tibia, you can see the shape of the femur, and it will be in green. And you know this part. For example, if I'm taking an anterior. Uh, you know, distal femur cut, it will show me exactly what part of the bone has to be resected. So I'll put my saw there uh, and I will press the trigger and only then, of course, I have to direct it. All this I have to do myself. It will not do anything. Uh, yeah. But of course, it can adjust its position. If suppose my angle is a bit wrong, the, the saw will automatically adjust to the correct plane. Then I have to press the trigger and then I have to direct it so it will take an anterior cut or it will take a distal cut or it will take an uh, anterior, uh, you know, uh, chamfer, uh, posterior chamfer. So it will take the cuts when you point it uh, and you press the trigger and push. You know, it is not going to move on its own. So semi-active, I would say, is 99, 90, maybe 90%. Uh, 9% in the surgeon's control. So everything is done by you only. You open the knee just like you open a standard knee. All that is done by you. The bony cuts alone, you would have planned that, yes, I'm going to take 8 millimeters of the bone uh, distally. And it will take, uh, I mean, it will help you to cut 8 millimeters. It will not let you cut uh, maybe 10 millimeters or it won't let you cut 5 millimeters. It will help you cut exactly 8 so in that sense, it is helping you and it's giving you the feedback if you are, you know, moving this way or that way. So uh, semi-active, I would say everything is virtually the surgeon's hands. The, 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 the robot is like an extra tool which is helping you, you know, do your job better. But you are doing everything yourself, basically. About the uh, learning curve, how long? Learning curve, yeah. I felt around 10 okay. cases. I was very comfortable. Uh, even Professor Haddad has said, you know, in his papers, he has said eight cases. Uh, in, uh, in I think, uh, uh, hips, he said eight and 13, he said in knees. But on an average, I thought around 10 cases uh, is, you know, is where you suddenly become very comfortable handling uh, you know the the robotic arm or directing the cuts. You don't you don't make it. You know you don't jump around too much. You do it in a very precise manner. So uh, understanding uh, the robotic software is one thing. Then you have to practice on cadavers. And uh, you know our training. You won't believe it. Uh, was so rigorous that they actually flew down. From the U.S., they flew, flew down two knees. Um, you know, cadaveric knees were actually the specimens were fl flown down from U.S. And a surgeon came, and uh, because they are so particular, they didn't want uh, you know any any doubts about the kind of uh, cadavers that we would be operating on. They they flew it down from the U.S. 
an american surgeon came he directed us you know the workshops were, were one full day of practicing on uh, cadaveric me then we did it on a saw model so i think it takes a little bit of training definitely it's not as straight forward as we think it is uh and the training is good i mean once you have been trained um, things definitely uh, move much better how easy or difficult is the transformation from uh, for yourself and also for the theater staff from manual to robotics yeah it takes a lot of lot of uh, training actually uh, training in the sense not so much as uh you know the theaters of uh, staff obviously don't need to learn about how the you know ct scan works or what you need to do in the planning but they need to get used to the the uh, you know instrumentation which is a bit different like you know you, you have to know how to uh, handle a probe or what can there are two kinds of probes is a green one and a blue one so you know when you have to give the green one to the surgeon when you have to give the bl- blue one to the surgeon uh most of the other instrumentation is pretty much the same um for the uh, i think hospital staff we did not have to teach them personally the the makeup product specialist used to give them lectures and show them few things how to drape the robot how to uh, you know drape the patient so it was uh, i think it was fun from what i could make out the staff actually enjoyed a change in the usual routine and they were also very excited you know there are certain things when you are registering the robotic arm uh, you have to uh, do certain maneuvers which the staff does we don't have to do that they the staff uh, does all those maneuvering uh, and they are enjoying all that from what i realized it didn't take them very long um and it was good fun uh, so the whole journey i would say has been quite fun it has not been a taxing kind of thing nobody ever complained that oh we are not able to you know do this or <laughs> it's taking uh, you know a uh, terrible time or anything but like everyone enjoyed it so it was good fun what about the implants uh, <coughs> you, sorry you know the the type of implants that can be applied using the robo uh, can you do pcl sacrificing pcl retaining yeah, uh, yeah. patellar resurfacing exactly. yeah that's a, that's a very good question uh, because my colleague he does a lot of cruciate retaining and i'm a ps guy so i do you know cruciate sacrificing i sorry we lost your voice no we cannot hear you uh, is it okay now yes yes so uh, what i've heard from a lot of american surgeons lot of people have actually moved to cruciate retaining after robotics came in you know they were they were uh, cruciate sacrificing surgeons before but they said it, things are so precise that we can actually do cruciate retaining and lot of people have actually uh, switched to cruciate retaining uh, surgery so yes with the robot you can be very precise your cuts can be very precise you can spare the the cruciate you can balance the knee uh, and it's it's a philosophy i think if you are if you are uh, comfortable and you you believe in cruciate retaining you can certainly do that and the partial knee you are doing was that uh, fixed bearing or mobile bearing uh the striker uses a fixed bearing uh, they don't have a mobile bearing uh, like the oxford knee so this is a fixed bearing uh, and i have spoken to various surgeons uh, and many have said that it's not an absolute must to have an acl so even if you have an incompetent acl uh, you can still go ahead and do a uni uh, with uh, a fixed bearing so i have done that no problems uh, and they are doing patients are doing well but by and large most of my knees that i do partial knees are usually they come early stages so most of them have acls but occasionally i do come across a case where 
the acl is incompetent or only a few fibers are left but i have not done uh, an acl reconstruction and a uni uh, i know some surgeons do that um, but it with a fixed bearing it's not an absolute must so sir la shop please Yes, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sarnivas. Uh, uh, Professor Malhotra, if you, uh, prof I'm sorry, Professor Mohan, if you allow me, please, uh, two questions. Uh, first yes, question sir. for you, sir, uh, is uh, for, you have mentioned, sir, that there is uh, three uh, robotic uh, systems, the active and the semi-active and the passive. What's the advantages taken from the uh, passive robotic surgery? Yeah, I think... if it is if it is very passive uh, the 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 thing about uh, passive this thing i think i am i think da vinci uh, probably uh, will come uh, in the maybe in the passive because you know again da vinci will probably not do anything unless there is a surgeon you know playing with the with the with the uh, uh, you know uh, at the station which is next to the patient you have a surgeon playing with the controls and moving everything and the da vinci arm will will uh, you know operate only then so <clears throat> there it's very passive because the, the 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 surgeon is not handling the robotic arm he's sitting away from the patient he's got no contact with the patient he's sitting away from the patient he doesn't get a feedback of how it feels to for example uh, when the robotic arm is touching an intestine or if it is touching a liver he he doesn't get any feeling whereas for me i know exactly how it feels because the saw is in my hand you see and i am touching the bone myself so i know exactly how the bone is feeling whether it is a good bone good quality bone or a very osteoporotic bone immediately i know because the way i am cutting you know i i know how easy the the, the saw is going through so this feedback is is not there when you are doing a passive robot so my in my case the robot allows me to do all the cuts but if i am cutting into the soft tissue for example if my saw is wandering away the it will stop because that is not in the plan you know the haptic window stops me from wandering into the soft tissues i mean this is especially relevant when for example you are cutting the posterior tibia you can't see the posterior tibia completely because it's part of it is under the femur but my saw blade will allow, allow me to go into the posterior tibia very safely because on the screen i know it will not go beyond the back of the posterior cortex it will not let me go into the popliteal fossa because the robot will stop the moment my saw reaches the edge of the posterior cortex tibial cortex it will stop it will not go 1 mm beyond it so that is the kind of haptic feedback i get you know even if i close my eyes and i just close my eyes and direct the saw posteriorly it will not keep on going it will stop as soon as i reach the end of the posterior cortex that is the kind of haptic feedback which is which is amazing which is amazingly accurate and i i i showed you a video i mean i showed you a picture where if i am taking for example uh, a tibial cut in a unicondylar uh, unicompartmental knee it will stop short of the acl because your plan in your plan you have positioned the uh, uh, component that it will not encroach onto the acl so your cut also will take you just close to the acl and not into the acl it will not touch a single fiber of the acl it will stop short because your plan only extends till there so that is the advantage of haptic feedback you know it it gives you an active feedback for example either the saw will come to a halt it will jerk and stop and you have to reposition your saw to take another cut so the haptic feedback is very active in that sense it will tell the surgeon that no you cannot extend beyond this boundary so it's very safe you know you can never cut any soft tissue yes sir the second question professor mohan if you allow me please sure uh, sure please we are uh, we are familiar with uh, medial and lateral unicompartmental knee replacement 
treatment. But for the patellofemoral replacement alone, do you do it uh, frequently, sir? Not very frequently. I have very few numbers. Uh, and my, uh, you know, the, the uh, reasons where I do patellofemoral are very specific. You have to be... Uh, absolutely clear that, that that there is no medial and uh, lateral compartmental wear or minimal wear. Most of the wear is behind the patella and on the trochlear uh, groove. It has to be entirely there. Medial and lateral compartments are relatively quite healthy. The, the spaces are well maintained on an x-ray. If you look at a skyline view, you will notice that the patella is touching uh, the lateral facet of the patella is resting on the femur. There is no space there. Most of the time, there will be uh, lateral osteophytes. And, you know, when you do a CT scan, it will be very obvious. The rest of the knee will be looking quite pristine. But when you come to the patellofemoral uh, part, you will see cysts there. You will see big osteophytes. You know, the, the surface will be worn out. It will be very clear. So, only in patients who tell me that their, com their, their complaints are entirely in the front of the knee. They will be saying anterior knee pain. They don't have any medial pain. They don't have any lateral pain. Uh, and their complaints are very specific. They cannot climb stairs. Uh, you know, going upstairs is, is, is torture for them. Uh, they cannot squat. Uh, they, they, they find walking quite difficult because... Uh, because of this patellofemoral wear. So I have very specific patients like that uh, mm -hmm. where you can actually see it yourself. Uh, and in such patients only, I will do patellofemoral. Also provided the patella is quite thick because you need at least uh, 14 to 15 millimeters of patella. After you resect the, the patella, you need space for the, the button, which is 8 millimeters. You need at least 14 millimeters thickness of the remaining patella because if it's anything less, it may fracture. So your total pre-operative patellar size should be something like 22 millimeters or more. You know, it should be that thick. So more than 20, 22, 23, 25 is very good. Um, and of course, it should be very frank patellofemoral way. Only in such cases, uh, patients, I will do a patellofemoral. So I don't have many patients, but I have done uh, maybe around a dozen cases. Thank you, sir. Dr. Srinivas, please. Just one, just one more. Uh, um, yeah, are, there, are there any instances where you had to abandon uh, the robotic and then go manual? What are the reasons if you have? Yeah, I think I showed you one case where I thought... You know, there was a phase when I was so much into uni compartmental knees, I was uh, getting, you know, kind of getting a bit confident. Uh, I had done more than, you know, 50 or I mean, more than 150 cases. And I felt I could do, you know, unis very well. So there was this uh, patient who, uh, you know, had a virus of 15 on one side and 23 on the other side. So I thought, you know, the deformities were passively correctable. So I thought, yes. Maybe I can I can do it, but uh, even though there was medial compartmental wear only, once I opened the knee, I realized there was another problem. The knee was uh, also going into a bit of hyperextension. So whenever there is hyperextension, you have to be very careful. Anything which has got more than say ten degrees of hyperextension, you should not attempt uh, unicondylar replacement. So it should be less than 10 degrees. So this patient had not only uh, medial wear, but under anesthesia, the knee was going into 13 degrees of hyperextension. So then I realized that it's very difficult if you want to balance the knee with just a unicompartmental component, uh, it's very difficult to balance it. So that is when I changed my plan in TROP. And the versatility of the, the software is such that you can... You can, you know, you can tell the product specialist was that there'll be a technician or an engineer who will be actually feeding in the numbers, and you can tell the the, the person that you would like to change to uh, total. It's not very difficult. The software is all there, and they can immediately change it. And it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes more, but you get your plan again, and you can get all your cuts again. 
and the whole thing is much more simpler uh, with the total knee so there was this one case where uh, bilateral uh, i changed from uni to total knees i had already told the patient that uh, at any point if things are difficult inside uh, we will change to total so for the patient it is not a surprise but for me it was a big lesson uh, not to you know overstep my uh, limits one last question from the viewers dr sanjay shrivastava um, does robotic surgery help in preventing iatrogenic spread of aids and other infections uh not very sure about that i mean uh, how does how does it help uh, i'm not very sure exactly how that is possible i mean any any uh, knee you're operating uh, i don't know uh, i i guess you you go through the same same uh, risks that you face in any uh, knee or any uh, you know joint that you have exposed that that risks of infection is there but you take all the necessary precautions precautions yes uh, yeah so if you take all the necessary precautions i don't see why there should be any extra risk or any uh, reduction it does not re- reduce risks of transmission really no 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 it doesn't i don't see yeah. uh, it uh, doing anything like that okay thank you very much thank you so much professor teddy mohan for this very interesting and very valuable presentation about a very interesting topic sir thank you so much sir thank you all of you thank you sir thank you, our next much. speaker will be professor uh, wail samir professor of uh, orthopedic surgery and champs university and one of the famous arthroplasty surgeons in egypt and one of the cornerstones of ao chapter in egypt professor wail is my dear friend professor wail you are very welcome sir Thank you so much to Dr. Asha for uh, for this kind of invitation of you and uh, for all, and uh, I'm very honored to share this uh, with the Indian group uh, uh, which are they are famous and difficult cases of uh, arthroplasty all over the world and have very impact on the progress of science all over the world and thank you again for Dr. Mohan for this very interesting uh, subject uh, of uh, robotic which is the coming era of uh, total knee arthroplasty so it is not a crossfire or debate about uh, uh, which is very common in our congress in arthroplasty between the robotic and non robotic techniques actually the uh, the term of manual navigation uh, referred to one of my dear friends dr hoffman from austria from stolz apple in austria when i got some uh, course there uh, about 14 years ago uh, which how to improve the the conventional total knee arthroplasty to to give the near to navigation or the robotic as you all know that the, the robotic sir navigation decrease a lot of number of the outliers in our techniques but still by conventional by meticulous conventional techniques you you can improve your uh, techniques sorry for that uh is clear now uh, yes the slide. yes okay. so the total knee arthroplasty as you know it is very efficient in improving uh, the functional and the pain but still we have a considerable percentage of our patients are not satisfied by total knee arthroplasty in the absence of more major complication as and you all know that about 15 to 20% of our patients they are not satisfied by different method uh, as regards psychological of the patient the dependence of the non steroidal preoperative the experience of pain post operative and one of the modalities to improve this to decrease the malalignment and the outlier of our patients and to create the pain uh, post operative and there is a, a great change in our concept of uh, st- understanding the philosophy of alignment in total knee arthroplasty and there is nowadays an era of shifting from the mechanical alignment which is very friendly as regard the implant survival to go for the more anatomical and the kinematic and the functional alignment to get more satisfaction of our patient and restore the pre arthritic 
uh, condition of this patient the, and the alignment of this patient. And one of course of this to improve this alignment is the use of more technology as regard to the robotics as, as we discussed by Dr. Mohan uh, before uh, this webinar. And to go for a proper alignment of the patient, either to go manual or through navigation or the through robotics, this is the main items to for a proper alignment. But still, till now, there is none of the alignment strategy proved to absolute uh, to absolute uh, efficiency or uh, stability as regard the efficiency of this alignment as regard the patient satisfaction. Still, we have a lot of surgeons still, and and I one of them to to confine to the mechanical alignment and using the conventional methods in total knee arthroplasty, but with some sort of improving my techniques to to get or to decrease the outliers in my technique in the conventional total knee arthroplasty and actually the computer assisted surgery may uh, enable the beginner surgeon and improve of course the expert surgeon and and i i, I disagree to, to that the computer assisted surgery should be confined to non expert sur surgeon no it is, should be confined to the expert surgeon because the expert surgeon if you have any errors due to in the surgery, the expert surgeon will detect any problems with the robotic and go back to the conventional methods if 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 it is needed. So in theory, the computer assisted or robotic assisted total knee arthroplasty design to, to decrease the potential for human errors in component alignment and ligamentous balance. But the question is, does it translate to improve the short and long-term clinical results and the patient reported outcomes measures or not? And at this point, we, we may find a very conflicting result in the literature. A lot of literature with will concluded in their conclusion in the literature that the computer assisted and robotic assisted surgery, of course, will improve the patient reported outcomes and radiographic alignment and decrease the number of outliers. On the other hand, a lot of literature that concluded there is no significant change in the patient reported outliers or the uh, outcomes or difference does not have a clinical correlation despite there is a there is a difference between the conventional and the robotic in the percentage of the outliers but the increased number of outliers in conventional in comparative to the robotic does not affect much the clinical correlation or the patient reported outcomes. What we mean by the conventional navigation, how to improve your technique in the conventional method. The same as robotic, you should identify the joints that will depend on the, your alignment at the end of the surgery by identification of the hip center and the ankle center before you start your surgery, where your center of the hip, where is your center of the ankle, and with meticulous identification of multiple bony landmarks for rotation and alignment, and don't follow the instrument blindly. You can intraoperative play with the instrument and play with the implant. You can anteralize your component. You can posteralize your component. You can medial or lateralize your component according to the individualize the patient. You can increase the cut and decrease it according to the situation of the patient. So in in this term of conventional navigation, you check and recheck every step. And every one of us has a computer system inside his brain to modify his technique during the surgery. So trust your own software and your computer system inside your brain. First, I will I should identify the center of the ankle, and this is proven by multiple studies and the MRI studies that we have the center of the ankle. It is immediately lateral to the tibialis anterior insertion. And this is very, very easy to identify the tibialis anterior and make uh, a mark just lateral. So 
if the tibial cut is perpendicular to the mechanical axis, the, the road should be pointed this to this point just lateral to the tibialis anterior. On the other hand, there is a correlation between the femoral pulsation and the center of the hip. And this is proven by multiple study about the relation between the pulse and the center of the hip, that the pulsation is immediately medial to the center of the hip. So we put, we put before we start a mark over the pulsation of the femoral. So the road for the coronal alignment of the femoral component should be lateral to this landmark immediate lateral. If we go more medial, this means the cut is more in valgus. And if go lateral, this is meaning more varus. And usually may be common in such cases with a uh, severe osteoporosis. So the inside road inside the medulla, it is not actually centralized inside the medulla, maybe pointing lateral or medial, and this is affect the angle of the cutting of the distal cut and should correct it and check that again by the extra medullary road pointing to the center of the hip. So the same to identify the pointage to should be referred to at during your conventional surgery. And this is how the tibial component will check by multiple check, not only one point, the agage line between the medial third and lateral two third of the tibial tubercle and between the two tibial spine process and direct to the PCL, the anterior curve on curve, the curve of the tibial component with the anterior curve, especially the anterolateral curve of the proximal tibia. This is how to uh, improve the rotation of the tibial component and the tibial crust. And this is how to identify this line before we start the cutting of your cut of the proximal tibia by a cautery to make sure that the cutting jig is directed into the anteroposterior plane of the tibia, not going more in varus or in vargas, because if you go in more internal rotation, the intending slope of the of the tibia may increase the varus or the valgus of the tibial component. And even uh, after the cut, we check again. This is again a check by using this one with the crest of the tibia. And this is how to create again the line after the cut and should be parallel to the main axis, anteroposterior axis of the tibial component to and the anterolateral part anterolateral part of the tibia to to make sure that anterior curve on curve recheck again the rotation of the tip cut and this is the point how to use the road to be pointing to the lateral part of the tibialis anterior to check that you are perpendicular and pointing to the center of the ankle if the time and very common in some uh, instrument that this point is is, is usually in varus cut mild virus cut so this will point more lateral and we, we recheck this again and recut the tibial again from medial to lateral to improve the coronal alignment of the tibia on the other hand as mentioned by dr Rutan, that we should individualize the valgus angle of the patient by the long fill and we check the preoperative valgus angle of this patient between the mechanical axis of the femur and the anatomical axis of the femur and determine the preoperative. And this is independent of the degree of arthritis or the interarticular deformity. So if the patient has six degree, we'll ask uh, the, the, the representative of the company to, to make it six or five or six. And again, after this one, we should confine and recheck this distal cut by using this extra medullary road to be pointing to the center of the hip, which is immediately lateral to the mark. We using this plastic uh, component of the tongue depressor to be uh, easily felt under the uh, <coughs> sterilization of this patient. And we check the thickness of the distal part of the femur. If it is less than the thickness from uh, of the uh, component, less than nine, which is the main thickness, and with, and the thickness 
of course will be measured from the normal size with the normal articular surface so we can increase the cut by two millimeters or not and if we have a flexion deformity or maybe increase this cut so we are checking every step during uh, during our procedures to to make sure that our cuts and our rotation and our alignment is uh, extremely accurate as regard the rotation, we we never we never rely on one axis. We rely on the posterior condylar axis, which may be affected if you have an an erosion or rheumatoid arthritis affecting the posterior condyles. So they make many errors if you depend on the posterior condylar axis by using the standard instrument. So our take home message: don't follow the instrument blindly. We should check and. The Recheck again. We make the three axes: the white side line, which is between the deepest part of the trochlea and the apex of the notch, and making a line for the transepicondylar axis, and make sure that our rotational alignment is perfect as regard this femoral part of the the patients, and we may use the tibial cut as a reference for the rotation also. And this is how we check again between the two pins, which indicating the rotation of the coming instrument that will cut the anterior and the posterior cuts and make the proper rotation. And this is the Matterhorn sign that we have a good external rotation. So we're removing more from the lateral anterior and then median. And we check before any cut by the saw that we are not making a notch. May do the, the, the cut from the extra slot. So we are assuring that we don't make a notch if we are going to the notch, we should enteralization of this part more anterior. So it adjusts the instrument according to the situation intraoperative. And this is again the check between the posterior condylar axis and the three degree of the external rotation in relation to the posterior condylar axis. And using <clears throat> what is called the hybrid technique between the measured resection technique and the gap balancing to get the best balancing between the extension gap and the flexion gap. Because we start first by the tibial cut and the distal femoral cut and, and make this gap balanced. And we need to reproduce this gap in the flexion gap. This is the gap balancing, but we 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 mix between the uh, the measured resection technique and the gap balancing and make this cautery to be sure that would be confined with the proper sizing of the femoral component and this is the cautery after distraction of the femoral up and distraction of the flexion part and this is the, the cautery inside and and be sure that this cautery uh, this line by the gap balancing is matched with the measured resection technique done by measuring of the anteroposterior diameter of the femur to be sure that will end by not alternating the joint line, which is the main disadvantage of the uh, gap balancing. And we do the proper balancing between the flexion and the extension gap, which is the main advantage of gap balance. So using the hybrid technique between the two technology is uh, more accurate for the patient for gap balancing. And for the, the last 10 years, it is completely, I do one X-ray, a film intraoperative image to be sure that everything is okay uh not uh, and no much time and usually the answer coming from the patellar tracking and the assessment of the intraoperative line if everything is okay and i am sure about the corona the coronal cut the sizing of the femoral component the there is no impingement there is no lateralization uh, about the flexion, there is no notching. Everything can be modified intraoperative by using a single uh, image in uh, intra intraoperative. Uh, 
and, and this is most of the cases I, I I will not show a lot of cases because we we we, we should sure about before uh, this patient coming from the OR that everything is okay and you, we we cannot accept that the patient after going to the ward and make an X-ray that we are uh, we have some sort of uh, a component malposition or component malrotation for this patient that make problem and even in severe case as you know that it's much easier with the conventional methods at regard to the robotics. Again, the robotic versus conventional primary total knee arthroplasty is a clinical and radiological long term with minimal for up to 15 years. Uh, this is uh, 2019 showed excellent improvement in both groups without any significant difference between the groups. The conventional total knee higher number of outliers compared to the robotic of course but the cumulative survival rate was 98.8 percent in the robotic and 98.5 for the conventional total knee arthroplasty so in their conclusion that excellent survivor in both robotics and the conventionally with a similar clinical outcome at the long term of follow-up. Of course, the robotic is a great and joint step in improving the alignment of the patient. And I think the most important in the coming era of using the robotic is the change of the alignment philosophy in our patient. What is called the functional or personalized alignment of every single patient. How to go? But in a straightforward cases and in even in severe cases, when you do a mechanical alignment, the conventional methods with a meticulous technique with multiple identification of the pony inside and the multiple axes and identification of the hip center and the ankle center before and using the image inside the operative for single for single image for this patient will get the much better, which is similar to. Of course, the robotic alignment is very attractive, very attractive and promising for, for most of our lives and they will make our lives is not simple cases, but errors may still occur with this robotics and, and literally you said done at least conventional methods and the convert to the conventional methods during the surgery. So still the conventional methods, the meticulous technique is the, the gold standard. And another papers in 2023, in this year, there is no difference in the clinical outcomes and survival shape of the robotics, navigational, and the conventional primary total knee arthroplasty with a minimal follow-up of 10 years with the same cumulative 10 year survival rate with about 97.4 for the robotic groups and the 96.6 for the conventional groups and the 98.2 for the conventional for the navigational group with no significant difference. A rate of complication associated with surgery were not significantly different among the groups. And they concluded in their study that satisfactory survival rates for robotic, navigational, and the conventional and have a similar clinical outcomes during the long-term follow-up and may need for a larger study with a continuously serial data are needed to confirm their findings. My take-home message that robotics is a very... Uh, fancy tools or additive tool to increase the consistency and decrease the outliers. Robotics, not a substitution to learn the proper conventional total knee arthroplasty technique and the mastering the technique. There is no contradictory between the conventional and the robotic assisted total knee arthroplasty. Mastering the technique on conventional gives the same results comparable to the computer assisted or the navigational assisted total knee arthroplasty. And at last, trust and update your own computer system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Well, I, And I think uh, your final uh, take home message and uh, that's uh, all of us uh, should be uh, aware of it, that we have to be uh, professional and uh, uh, we have to master the technique of conventional total knee replacement before going to the yes. navigational or the robotic. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question for you from uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay, uh, Professor Wael. Will robotic surgery enable doctors uh, to not be 
subjected to consumer protection legalization? Uh, uh, consumer? Consumer protection legalization. Uh, medical legal aspect, do you mean? Yes, I think so, yeah. It's, it's uh, actually in Indian, uh, consumer protection legislation is an Indian legislation where the consumer mm -hmm. uh, files a case against uh, uh, the, the, the surgeon doing the surgery. So, so do you mean that India will will uh, will legalize anything about not using or using the robotics? Well, I think the question is about uh, whether robotics will have an effect on uh, medical legal aspects. Uh, how is it going to um, uh, affect the medical legal uh, aspects? In maybe with, with with the widespread of the robotics and the improved very accuracy uh, as regard the restoration of the alignment and a very good marketing tools uh, to be widespread worldwide may end in that if you don't use the robotic you may be subjected to legal issue the same scenario as if you go nowadays for an open surgery for meniscal excision or meniscal repair in open surgery, you may subject it to legal issue because nowadays the, the gold standard is using arthroscopy, not using an open surgery. But yeah. I think this era is not yet proven all over the world or not accepted all over the world. Yes, but do you think by time, Dr. Weil, that the uh, robotic surgery will replace the conventional technique of total replacement? In, in 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 one scenario, if the, uh, the if the personalized alignment or the functional alignment or the whatever they 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 told us about uh, the kinematic alignment will be very well proven for the patients to increase the patient satisfaction. I think the best for to to restore the personalized alignment is using uh, one of the additive tools of robotics. Uh, and, and I think they are uh, both are additive to each other. But in a mechanical alignment that is the main uh, used nowadays, still nowadays, in 80% of the cases all over the world, maybe, uh, still, I think the products will not add much for the restoration of the mechanical alignment of the patient. But if you go for more kinematics and this philosophy or very widespread and accepted by the majority of the orthopedic or arthroplasty surgeon, we should shift for, for the robotics, which had add more value in this aspect. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Mohan, uh, you have any uh, comments, sir? Uh, you, you, are, you are muted, sir. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I fully agree with uh, uh, Professor uh, Well, uh, what he says. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, robotic, I don't think will completely take over. There are uh, several instances when robotic will help. But, uh, you know, uh, I think it will still be a long way before robotics become so widespread and you know, so cheap that everyone starts using it. Uh, so I think one of the costs, one of the factors why it will probably not become so widespread is the, the cost at the moment. You know, that cost is a big in hindrance. Uh, the other thing is uh, it might help in medical legal cases in the sense. Uh, one thing I've noticed is all the pre-plans that we do uh, with the robotic software is already stored. I mean, it is not lost. For example, the even though we have done, you know, hundreds of cases, my first case or the first knee or the first hip or the first 50 hips or whatever, uh, we have the, the, you know, we have all the pre-plans of every patient from, from the first patient to the last patient. So in that sense, we have all the pre-plans and all those pre-plans uh, can always, you know, come in useful. If there is ever a legal case saying the patient says, you see, my knee uh, is not in a good position or whatever. I mean, we can easily show that, you know, this was your pre-plan, which was perfect. We can always 
make use of these pre plans and the interop uh, you know uh, procedures how it went we have every recording uh, that is part of you know a robotic case and that way you can always uh, show them that this is what was done and it is not the mistake of the surgeon you know i'm i'm just uh, imagining a, a situation where that could come in useful i know i do know that after the meco i mean after the robotics have come in to hip replacement for example you know uh, people used to sue earlier the surgeons for limb length discrepancy i believe that has really come down because now your plans and uh, the way you can execute uh, hip replacements you can take care of lld's or limb length discrepancies so now uh, that kind of legal uh, suing has come down so court cases have definitely come down so in that case you know in that sense robotic can help you see so it has got its uses certainly in in medical legal uh, you know uh, scenario thank you sir uh, dr sarni vas yes sir uh, a question to professor vail uh, this is regarding uh, for the uh, talk sir it's it's a very good talk um, and very good tips also on how to improve your alignment on uh, during knee replacement um, you know you have showed uh, uh, how to improve the alignment by uh, aligning with the hip and the ankle preoperatively so if you spend a little bit of time with your regular knee replacements um you may be able to get a proper alignment with the regular knee replacement itself so do you think uh, doing a ct scan like they do for robots um for uh, a regular um, you know manual knee replacement would improve the sizing and alignment as well uh we just finished the uh, assesses md degree in our university and uh, for one of the my fellows for the uh, comparing between the conventional methods in assessing why by using this multiple uh, axes and using the ct preoperative to detect the rotation required for this individual patient and uh, and we did about 30 patient with this one and the 30 patient on and we don't find much difference between to do for or a ct preoperative or without using the ct and depending on the intraoperative multiple axes identification of this patient with rotation and we didn't find a big difference in in patient as regard the alignment or rotation of the femoral component okay so so with just x rays you will be you, you can do a yes. similar job as yes. okay thank you so much i think we have no more questions sorry uh, you sorry. have a question sir no sir i was just asking about the sizing of the implants yes will, will the ct help with the sizing uh so we we depend on sizing mainly in the intraoperative uh measure we we, we we and we don't use the ct for the sizing it is an intraoperative measure and using uh the gender knee if we have discrepancy between the antero posterior uh, uh, and the mediolateral one and usually we don't have a problem in this the problem is if you have a system does not have this uh, discrepancy between the mediolateral and posterior because as you know that the knees in the middle east is may be different in the the shape and the sizing uh, in comparative to the western uh, knees which was developed and sizing for this types of implant which are coming from the europe or the usa thank you sir thank you so much sir uh, i think we have no more questions and we come to the end uh, finally i would like to thank uh, professor tadi mohan professor wael samir my dear friend dr sir nivas and uh, also uh, eva pharma company and ortho tv for sharing the uh, this webinar live many thanks to all of you and uh, have a nice time and uh, good night thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you everybody sir thank, thank you, you so much everybody. Bye. See you next Friday, inshallah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Yes.